All right, welcome everybody to Legal Tech Week for June 21st, 2024. This is the show where we talk about the latest news in legal tech and innovation with our panel of legal tech journalists and bloggers. I'm Bob Ambrogi. I write the blog Law Sites and I have a podcast called Law Next. And our panelists this week are uh, Nikki, you want to kick us off introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Nikki Black. I am the head of SME and external education at Affinape, um, which is the parent company of my case, LawPay, DocketWise, and CasePeer in the legal side of things. And I write legal tech columns for um, ABA Journal, Above the Law, and The Daily Record. And I oversee and write um, a bunch of industry and benchmark reports that come out of Affinapay. And I'm excited to talk about a lot of the things we've got on uh, on deck this week. Yes, on deck. All right, on deck. Uh, and uh, next on deck, Victor. Hi, everyone. My name is Victor Lee. I'm <laughs> the managing editor for the ABA Journal, uh, focusing on business of law and technology. All right, that, that's it. It seems so concise after Nikki's, Nikki's got so many more things she does. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, I just do stuff. Yeah, okay. And uh, live from JFK, Stephanie. Yes, um, Stephanie Wilkins, editor-in-chief of Legal Tech News ALM. I just landed back from Legal Geek on a delayed flight where I had no Wi-Fi, so I'm multitasking and talking to you all and trying to meet a deadline and talking to you from the airport before I go home. Yeah, all right. And, uh, and uh, Joe, you're up next. Yeah, Joe Patrice uh, from Above the Law. I'm uh, I'm at RFK Jun live from RFK Junior. In that I'm, it's hopeless and I'm very confused here. Uh, but <laughs> not not that I know we still have more introductions. But as a quick aside, given that I made the RFK thing, did anybody see uh, Nicole Shanahan's like attempt to actually be a candidate this week? No, she like, did interviews and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah it, was, she, it, was, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. Yeah. She's a, uh, I, I don't, in the annals of third party running mates, she's not quite Admiral Stockdale, but she's, uh, she's not doing a pretty good, a very good job. <laughs> Were there also more moments where she said, I didn't know Kennedy stood for that or said that or. No, she, 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 she talked about how she knows how batteries are made. So therefore that qualifies her to be president someday. Yeah, it was, chips, it was chips, wild. chips might qualify her. All right, sorry, Steve. I guess yeah. you're all right, Steve. And then, yes, yeah, last but not least, Steve. <laughs> yeah, uh, Steve Embry. I write the blog Tech Law Crossroads. I'm coming to you from my virtual lake house, uh, and I uh, I don't know about her as a third party running mate, but I think running for president and having a discourse on the behavior of sharks probably ranks back up there just as well. <laughs> All right. Well, so uh, so uh, you guys not only survived last week without me here, uh, but actually uh, thrived, I would say. It was a really good show last week. I finally got a chance to go back and watch it. and It was a lot of fun and uh, appreciate you guys doing that while I was off speaking and having some fun in Asheville, beautiful Asheville, North Carolina. <clears throat> there need to be more legal tech conferences in Asheville, North Carolina. I think it's a really cool place. And uh, the hotel we were in was like really one of the nicer hotels I've been in in a while, and it would be perfect for a conference. It's like a, it's got all that meeting room stuff, but also bars and restaurants and fun things to do. So. We should also note it was Bob's birthday, y'all, for everybody. It else. was. It was my birthday. Coincidentally, with the with the conference, it kind of worked out that they had my all expenses paid trip to uh, this wonderful place and got to spend the weekend hanging out there. Um, so I'm going to later on, uh, I'm going to one of the topics I want to talk about is some thoughts I had coming away from that conference. Uh, and it happens to be in common with some thoughts that Steve had coming away from conferences uh, uh, recently. But uh, first of all, I think we ought to uh, talk about this story, Nikki, that you've got about, uh, well, dealing with the Supreme Court. You want to you want to tee it up? Um, yeah, <clears throat> well, I did have two stories. Um, the one that I um, submitted that time. I'm really just going <laughs> to throw over to Joe is um, there was a, uh, someone shared this on LinkedIn. And so um, 
It's uh, somebody who had used Claude to uh, enter briefs from a whole bunch of um, different Supreme Court cases. Oh, okay, you entered it there, Bob, thanks. Um, and then it asked Claude, uh, I think it was Claude Opus, like the most, the newest version, to uh, write opinions, like to analyze the briefs and then write the opinions. And one thing that we were just discussing before we came on the air is I think that I'm not sure whether Claude had, a lot of these were opinions that had also been handed down at that point. So it's unclear to me from reading the beginning part of his post, it's a very long post, by the way, whether he was able to isolate it <clears throat> so it didn't look at the final opinions that the court had handed down or not. But um, it essentially, it was just really interesting because he took a whole bunch of different Supreme Court cases, uploaded the briefs, and had it issue decisions and I'll let Joe talk about, because um, this is definitely his um, ballywick, is that the right word, um, to Supreme Court cases, and he'll have a lot more insight on the decision-making process that Claude um, went through. So take it away, Joe. Yeah, I thought it was a really fascinating article that uh, Nikki sent around to us before we got to it, uh, got to here, and I looked at it, and I thought it was really interesting. It did seem as though what he did was plug in the briefs of the parties as well as occasionally he said he plugged in, if there was a case law that was cited by everybody, he would plug in those cases uh, that were kind of the, the core case that was being uh, uh, at, at root, uh, the precedent. So I don't think he had the, Claude was looking at the decisions in these instant cases, but was instead taking that together. And one of the arguments was, look, to what extent are just uh, are any judge really just taking what the parties wrote in the brief, choosing which one they like, and basically regurgitating what was in that brief? And to some extent, that is how judges work. But what he found was that Claude's doing a really good job of looking at that and distilling from those briefs something that looks a lot closer to what a justice might actually write. Uh, I don't the conclusion was that it's basically a pretty good clerk right now. Uh, and while I am happy to uh, deprivilege a bunch of Yale and Harvard students from their opportunity to get a brass ring, I don't think that uh, it's all that crazy that it can do this, right? Like, to some extent, more so than any other court, I, the Supreme Court has the ability and has a demonstrated track record of how you can tell how it takes the party's briefs and rejiggers them into a decision, right? Uh, they have the ability to control their docket in ways that guarantee more or less that they're going to they're going to try to be viewpoint oriented. Uh, judges who have to take cases as they come might come to different decisions. The Supreme Court is literally choosing things because they agree with one side or the other of it. So in some ways, I didn't think that it was as applicable to all judges as it might seem, because I do think the Supreme Court is a unique case where it is very advocacy and viewpoint driven. But one thing that was really interesting about it, I thought, a, a second thing was interesting, and I'll shut up after this. Uh, the second thing that I thought was really interesting about it was it got some of the cases wrong, but by wrong, it would be a 5-4 case, and it would choose the dissenters. But is that really all that wrong? Uh, one of them in particular was the gerrymandering case where Alito uh, said the dissent didn't understand the Cooper precedent. Uh, Kagan in dissent said, well, I wrote Cooper, so I'm pretty confident I do understand it. Uh, and the Claude was like, I mean, Cooper exists, so of course Kagan's right. Uh, so I'm not altogether sure that when it was wrong, it was really all that wrong. Yeah, so I was the, I was the person that raised whether, <clears throat> whether Claude had access to the actual opinions that were written. And so that, I've been thinking about it as you were talking, Joe. So either it it did have access, in which case you can say, well, OK, it looked at the actual opinion and that sort of made it its opinion or it didn't have access. But if it didn't have access, makes me wonder what did it have access to? If it's just the briefs that he put in there, then how how did it come up with an answer 
with since it couldn't base it on other things except the language of the brief. So I guess the thing that I'm sort of getting at is so we 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 have a Supreme Court that is coming up with um, sort of unique opinions, or at least opinions that aren't necessarily consistent with the precedent. So you would you would think that a a, a generative AI model, if it looked at everything at all the law, all the things the Supreme Court had done might not necessarily follow the Supreme Court, this Supreme Court's opinion as much as it did. So I don't know. I, I, I just I wish I would have have a little more information about what it was actually looking at, because it did strike me as sort of, I don't know, kind of interesting that it, it it's so closely patterned what this Supreme Court did, which right. I mean, I guess most of us could have predicted it because we know the justices, but if you didn't know the justices and their personalities, then I'm not sure. I don't know. So anyway, unless something's changed, sense. I don't think any of the LLMs are being trained that on, on data that's that current. I mean, there's always a, right. uh, you know, it, it, it might be data ending a year ago or maybe six months. I don't know how current they are, but they're certainly not being trained on the last six months of, of data or anything like that. I don't think maybe I'm totally off on that. So I don't think I don't think it had access to sort of broader information about these particular cases or decisions. Which, well, that, well, that brings up another question, Bob. So he only asked it to to come up with opinions on cases that had been decided. And that makes me wonder, why didn't he say, OK, this is all well and good, but now I'm going to ask it to write an opinion on a case that hasn't been decided. Then we can see if it gets that right or not. Mm, so, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I don't mean to it. sit here and. and be, and poke holes in what was done because I think it was really interesting. And, maybe that's and next. Cool. Maybe that's coming. Maybe that's coming next. I mean, maybe he's got a. Uh, because because you a better part, hurry. Maybe, maybe that's <laughs> part two, right? Maybe that's part. Maybe part. Maybe part three is going to be how 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 will how will Chief Justice Claude, which I guess he got a promotion. Uh, Chief Justice Claude will will vote in the or or will decide the uh, the immunity case, right? Yeah. Well, I would really be interested to see if it if it had been able to answer the question how the court would have decided in the in the uh, Second Amendment, uh, you know, domestic abuse right. case that was decided today, which I was frankly a little surprised at the way it was decided. Not that I'm a Supreme Court guru or anything, but so I, was pretty I have I have multiple thoughts. Uh, one, I don't think it was trained on the it was given the opinions that actually came out and part of my argument for that is one he doesn't say he does does that but also uh then it pro if it were trained on those things then it wouldn't have gotten some of them wrong uh when it said when it shows the the dissenter's side that that seems to me it must either it's really dumb or it didn't have access to that which leads me to believe the experiment was a little bit better um as far as the justice uh Claude, I, I point to Justice Roboto, which was one of the all-time great law review entries at Above the Law, uh, which is our like musical competition. I stand by George Washington put in a thing about a robot Supreme Court justice to the soon to end it as a musical, and it's Chef's Kiss. And three, uh, the article about uh, if you are interested in today's gun case, uh, my article is not quite up, I don't think yet, but uh, you should absolutely check it out in an hour or so when it does come up. I think my favorite part about that entire um, post was how Claude started to call itself Justice Claude. Like, I don't know where that came from, but that made me laugh. It decided to just put on a Supreme Court hat and run with it. <laughs> Chief Justice Claude. He's Chief Justice. Oh. Right. <laughs> well, I didn't notice that right. Even better. <laughs> Well, no, but, but, but let's the, kind of reflect on that because I mean, like, like when, when this first started, like, you know, and, and I guess not to not to not to confuse all the AI tools, but like, you know, what was it? ChatGPT was barely was barely passing the bar exam, or like, kind of not, or maybe not so much. And now it's like writing opinions as a chief justice. I mean, it's been like, yeah, like barely more than a year, and this is how far how far it's come. So what's what's going to happen? What's going to happen in a few months? Like, like, it'll be yeah, like it'll be interesting to, to, to see where to see how how quickly it. It progresses even between now and like you know a few months from now. But I think all these questions about how it did this and how it works point to what we all know are one of the one of the you know dangers of using generative AI for lawyers is that it's it's a black box. And I can't, I, I was reading that article and it was, it was fascinating. I mean, reading the, this, the opinions it wrote and and uh, reading his even his descriptions of of his sort of rationale of how it did what it did. 
I think we just have no freaking idea what's going on here in the that's, background that's with exactly this technology. Right. We just really don't get it. And it's kind of scary. So, <laughs> Neither are the experts. So, yeah, right. I don't even know. Oh, maybe, I just say I'm not an expert. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, I wonder. Like AI experts that program this, they don't know what how it's no, working. Right. You know? no, yeah. Can like like in Las Vegas, can you like bet on how is the Supreme Court's gonna decide something? I mean, is that possible? I mean we can make some money no. here. <laughs> uh, no, no. However, uh, several years ago, there was a competition uh, that was sponsored by several people. I know Josh Blackman was one of them, uh, where you could go through and predict all of the cases through the whole term. And the winner who got the most right got something. I got like a $100 gift card or something out of that because I was I came in like third. Very annoyed by that. Not winning. But there was somebody. Was it Dan Katz or somebody or or Josh? who was doing the those the 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 money balling for uh, Supreme yeah. Court cases. Yeah, actually, Dan, Katz was part of that. So it was yeah. Dan Katz, Josh Blackman, and somebody else. Uh, I think doing it. Maybe Michael Bomber or Brito. It seems like everything everything Dan does, he does with Michael. I don't know. I mean, the rate this is going, it's going to be it's going to be kind of like Biff and Back to the Future with the sports. You know the the sports magazine that had all the results from the year, and he was able to bet on them all because he was got the book from anyway. Yeah, <laughs> that, that yeah. movie came out. Of, you know, Bob understands that trope in that movie. The rest of you probably don't. <laughs> I wasn't born then, Steve. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> how, how do you think we are, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the better question is how old? How old do you think I am? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I kind of, I, I, so I kind of felt like this whole, when I read, again, when I read that, that piece about the, the Supreme court decision, well, I, I know what I want to say. Actually, I did have one other thing I wanted to say relevant to this, which I, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the takeaways are from that article. Uh, but I do think that there is a major difference when you're talking about appellate decisions versus trial court decisions. Uh, and I, I, I have played around in my own, uh, in some of my own work with taking uh, some, some matters I've been involved in and taking transcripts and taking some exhibits and uploading them and asking for the creation of, you know, findings of fact or that kind of thing. And I know there's tools out there doing it now. I, I you know, uh, 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 what clear brief supposedly will produce finding you know is the, the uh, statement of facts in a case and there's some others out there doing it but when i've tried to do it just using commercial applications like like chat gpt it, i've not had good luck with it I, i've got I, I can get a ba pretty basic thing but it still needs a lot of work and it sometimes almost needs so much work that i still have to go back and it's almost easier to, to do it myself in some cases so uh, you know, I, I don't know when, when it, it, maybe it's easier when you have the simple thing of here's three briefs now write something based on this versus saying, here's a whole record of a case and here's a transcript of, of the testimony in the case. Uh, and, uh, you know, here's the uh, applicable case. Here's the party's uh, pretrial briefs or whatever. Now write a decision. Uh, it would be interesting to see what it could do with with all of that. It's a you know what's the what's the guy that has that company that um, he claims he can predict what a judge will do not based on what the judge has done in the past but on predicta, all the predicta, predicta. Well, well, I, predicta yeah well and so, and we all and we talked about uh, Adam Feldman's work the other day uh, uh, like a couple weeks ago I talked about that who also does that sort of thing. So I wonder if you if you plugged all that information into one of these large language models and ask it to predict, I wonder what it would do. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, and Andrew mentions Bench IQ, which is another one that just came out from his former co-founder, but uh, that's that's kind of going a little bit farther in terms of trying to evaluate judges' decision-making patterns based on their sort of the totality of, of what they've done from the bench, not just their written decisions, but uh, other rulings and stuff they've made. It's kind of an interesting product. Um, so uh, when I was thinking about that Supreme Court case, again, it had me, it had me thinking about the thing I wrote this week, uh, 
which was the, the kind of this this question of of to what extent uh you know we, we live in this bubble in a way I, we, you know we, i I, th I think about that I, when i'm on linkedin it's like everybody i know everybody i follow is talking about generative ai we come on the show we're all talking about generative ai and then i was at this conference with a whole bunch of trial lawyers and like none of them are talking about generative ai <laughs> and none of them have experimented with generative ai uh and and they're they're cu they're curious in a in a very broad sense i mean it's not like they haven't even heard of it but but you know again i i wrote a blog post this week about about this and i uh, you know when i when i kind of asked for a show of hands of who's even used chat gpt there was like a couple people in the room and, and who's used this in their law practice and nobody just blank stares. Uh, and in talking to people both before my presentation and after my presentation, you know, before my presentation, it was several people uh, saying, you know, I, I'm retiring soon. I, I don't have to worry about this. I mean, it reminded <laughs> me, Nikki, of, of that conference we did uh, in Monroe County back in, you know, like 2019 or something when, when we were do talking about duty of tech confidence. And there was that one lawyer saying, hey, I'm going to retire before I learn any of this crap. Uh, he's a convert, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's yeah. picked it up, but well, he's got his, he got an iPad during the pandemic and he actually asked me about chat GPT when I mentioned it in a comment at a last year at a conference. So, yeah. I mean, I think lawyers are at least receptive to it. Wasn't that the hurdle? The hurdle was falling on deaf ears. I don't think it's deaf ears anymore. It's just an issue of where they are in terms of actually adopting or approaching it. Yeah, and it, yeah. Well, I think I think it's also, again, with smaller firms in particular, I think there's just this sort of capacity issue of it, it seems overwhelming, I, I think, to even start to learn about this technology and you know, lawyers, we all know, have no time. And lawyers, I think, in smaller firms probably have less time than lawyers in larger firms, or at least less support to help them sort things out. So it's it's a big step to overcome to try and dive into what does this technology mean? How can it be used in my practice? How do I understand it? And so I think they're tending to just kind of like, you know, turn a blind eye to it to some extent. I, and I, I think I wonder, uh, I wonder too, Bob, I mean, I, I had had a similar experience also with a group of trial lawyers. And I wonder if there's something about trial lawyers, not their personality, but what they do that maybe makes them less willing to adopt it. It sounds sort of counterintuitive, but I, I it just, it's, I've heard it. I know Nikki, you've had a different reaction yeah. from a group of lawyers. So I, it's kind of hard well, to figure out. Most of the guys that I talked to were in smaller firms too. Mine so. was the Association of Defense Trial Lawyers. So uh, I spoke well, to the American so <laughs> Association of Defense Trial Lawyers. And um, so it was a national conference, but I found it, and I generally ask them not specifically chat GPT, but have you tried, have you heard of generative AI? Have you tried generative AI? Do you pay for generative AI? And have you, do you have access to legal generative AI? So I asked like a four part question <clears throat> and I have found that for the most part, I'm getting different responses than what y'all are suggesting and what Mark suggested in the comments. Um, and one thing I had, uh, we have a Slack that we all talk on and one thing I had posited and I wonder if it's, um, uh, it's not something I'd ever thought about but I wonder if there are technology geographic deserts in legal tech, if you will. Are there certain states um, maybe some southern states or, you know, states that are not closer to large, you know, where there aren't as many large cities or something that are sort of technology deserts, like they're less likely to adopt technology. I just wondered because, you know, you were in North Carolina and your experience was that, you know, this less receptiveness. When I spoke, it was to a national audience, you know, um, lawyers from across the country. But I've also spoken at a lot of other conferences. And when I spoke to one that was Virginia specific, there was less receptiveness. So I wonder if it may have something to do with the certain states being like, you know, we talk about legal des um, legal access deserts and stuff. Um, maybe you have the same thing with legal tech in terms of, and nope. the only thing I just wanna mention before I throw this out to someone else is, my, my thinking behind that is that, you know, there are different parts of the country have very different views on government, on independence, um, and, and, and on other sort of psychological aspects sort of, of groupthink. And it's because of the different immigration patterns hundreds of years ago, you know, when people immigrated from different parts of the world and sort of the uh, culture they brought with them. And so that's, you know, there are um, been studies that show that certain parts of the country 
And these different geographic regions have very different ways of approaching the world and government. And, and so I wonder if some, some of that impacts tech adoption or the approaches to tech. Well, the, the conferences that I went to, were they were national conferences as well. Although the last one I went to was in mid-March where that came up. So, you know, that could be different now. But, you know, that, I mean, these, these I, I don't know, it's a good, a good question, Nikki. It's hard well, to let me, I mean, let me say my answer. I have two answers to that. One is, first of all, this was North Carolina, uh, which has, you know, Raleigh-Durham Research Triangle area, you know, LexisNexis is a major facility there. I mean, this is not a tech backward part of the country uh, by any means. I'm sure there are corners of North Carolina that may be, but uh, I don't know if that's a good, it. And then I, my experience over time, and obviously I've been writing about tech for a long time, but over time, and I've, I've written about this before, is that uh, often solos and smalls are among the first to adopt new technologies, in part because they need them so badly. Um, and and a corollary to that is it's often been solos and smalls in more remote parts of the country because they don't have access to things like, you know, I mean, like in the early days of the internet, when, you know, Online research was adopted more quickly, I always thought, by by people in more remote parts of the country because they didn't have law libraries to go to or, or you know, ma major facilities to go to. And, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know whether that's a, a fair thing to say, but uh, uh, I, I don't know that there I don't know that there's a geographic aspect to it. It's an interesting point, and I, I don't know how we would ever know the answer to that. But um, I, I think it's something um, about the 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 fact that this technology seems in some ways seems very accessible because of its conversational interface but but the whole black box aspect of it makes it very seem very daunting it's such a whole new thing well, so it, I, could, it, oh. it could be a little bit of the sort of the group think i mean if, if you ask the question that you know nikki asked and you look around the room and nobody raises their hand i'm you know <laughs> and i say oh, i don't think i'll raise mine even though i'm using it all the time i don't want to be uh, so i don't know it's, so, so, you know, you mentioned it's trial lawyers, and I, 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 this is a broken record thing that I've talked about, it's been my point for a while, which is I, I don't think it's as good for that litigation applications right now as it is for others. I think if you're a uh, trust and estates doing wills and stuff like that, if you're doing compliance work, you're doing lots of corporate, whatever, it has more immediate application than it does in litigation in a lot of ways and to the extent it does have value in litigation it's in you know taking the facts and summarizing them such that you can write up something kind of cool and uh i also will say trial lawyers are the kind of people by design uh trial lawyers more so than even other motion practice litigators in the world trial lawyers think they're god's gift to everything they're the kind of people who don't want to say oh this computer can write it better than me they think that they're create they're a unique and special snowflake who's giving the greatest closing that's ever existed, and they don't need a robot to tell them how to do it. They're experienced. So, like, I think as a selection of a group, they're the least likely to be. Well, I just I disagree, and uh, based upon um, the experience that I've had, so I found that when I spoke to a group of elder lawyers, which are uh, primarily an advice and document based practice. Um, they oh, were Stephen, absolutely maybe. terrified. That was the, that was the, res what? Sorry. I thought you were talking about Steve and me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> elderly? No, you're not elderly, first of all, but no. But, um, uh, and the response I got after my talk was, we're terrified. This is terrifying. And one person said, and I, I appreciated the feedback. Did you actually think about who you were talking to when you created your presentation and they had a good point. You know, I, I sometimes get very defensive about feedback because oftentimes I think that it is not appropriate. That was appropriate because what I did was I showed them how chat GPT could create a document really rapidly, which is what they get paid to do, which is what terrified them because they realized, and, and this is the same with wills and trusts and estates, how quickly and how accurate, because I showed them, I'm gonna have it create this document and then I had it create it with Virginia law and um, it terrified them to see how quickly it changed and how accurate it was. And so, but when I speak to trial attorneys, they do see the application. And so like you referenced clear brief, Bob, um, what, and I, I was just talking to um, someone locally who uh, is um, in the criminal defense space, 
and oversees a whole bunch of attorneys. And um, what they need almost uniformly across whatever, whatever kind of litigation you're doing is sort of what ClearBrief does or what you're going to find in e-discovery software, which is when you can upload an entire record um, on appeal or an entire um, court uh, case record and, um, you know, and Q&A the record. You know, show me every time somebody talks about the intersection. Show me every time someone talks about the color of the car. And you can use that to help on cross. You can use that to draft motions and to draft the arguments. And so they need, um, what they really need is something that's a little more complex that isn't as easily accessible right now, but will be very soon. And it's once this stuff is baked into the tools everybody's using, which is what's happening, it just takes time to really provide those intuitive insights versus the initial surface low-hanging fruit things that you can do, like summarize a document. And so once it's really baked in and you can provide those analytical insights, <clears throat> whether for litigation or for running your law firm, you're going to find that A, it's just going to be immediately available in their software, and B, they're going to actually get get it and use it and understand the actual value. Yeah, and, when I, when I show them Nikki tools just, like... Uh, Nikki has just there. finished summarizing my article for me. Thanks, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, when I showed them some no, of the tools out there where, where you can interrogate a group of transcripts uh, and, you know, ask questions like, you know, has did this witness make any inconsistent statements uh, without you having to read all through it or do sort of try and define that with keyword searches or something. I mean, that they're they're impressed. They were clearly impressed by the things I was showing them. And certainly, as I said, after I finished the talk, there was a lot more people coming up to me saying, no, man, I really got to look into this or I wasn't aware that this is out there. And you know, I wrote in my article yeah. about the judge who came up to me and said, man, I wish I could have clear brief. I have to write my own opinions. I don't have any law clerks. I have to, this would be so helpful to me, but, but our court won't let us use any AI products. <laughs> like what? Well, I, I, you know, and I've talked to a couple of defense lawyers lately who've told me that the plaintiff's lawyers that they've been practicing against have all of a sudden gotten much better in their deposition and their thoroughness and completeness and they suspect that's what's going on is is some of these plaintiff lawyers are starting to use these tools to prepare witness outlines deposition outlines argument outlines and those sorts of things uh, yeah. pretty interesting yeah or the one that's out there for creating demand uh, packages where they train yeah. the ai against uh, tons of verdict and settlements uh, like hundreds of thousands of verdicts and settlements reports and you look, go through all your, your medical records and, and put together a demand package. Um, yeah, so. that's, a, that's a pretty interesting tool, actually. Yeah. All right, well, uh, so I guess, I, so I, I guess the bottom line of, of, of that, of, of my thinking on that was partly this, this question of whether there are certain lawyers that are, that are resistant to it, also that it, the ultimate impact of that is that it can sort of, sort of lead to a digital divide among law firms because the larger firm lawyers have their innovation officers and their KM people and, and you know, others there who are specialists in researching this technology and, and trying out different products and, and, you know, making decisions about which one they need, which one they don't need and helping to deploy and train and all of that. So, you know, obviously larger firms end up having, uh, an AI advantage, perhaps, if uh, if that's the way to put it, uh, over smaller firms, and and at least for some period of time, that could lead to some some imbalance, I, I think, uh, or greater imbalance than already exists between smaller firms and larger firms. I don't know. That's something to worry about. Well, but there's but there's a flip side to that too, because I mean, with any large firm, there's so much bureaucracy and so much, um, you know. We have to have a committee meeting on this. We have to have a firm wide discussion about whether we should do this or whether we should have, you know, um, we should implement this or integrate this or whatnot. Whereas, like a solo small firm can say, "Oh, well, I'm just going to use this tool and that's that." So, I mean, yeah. yeah, like, like there, there's the possibility that, like, you know, with more money, they could just supercharge whatever or come up with their own proprietary software or or something. But then, you know, I mean, is it going to be that much better than what's available, you know, for a solo firm? I mean, maybe, but, but. On the other hand, you know, would it be that would it make that much of a difference? I mean, if, if if people are already seeing like you know market improvements with like you know like litigators or you know civil litigators and whatnot just using the tool for the way it should be used. Let's 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 be honest, right? I mean, like we were worried about the people who like use it to use it to like do their work for them and not and not double check their citations and whatnot. And that's 
the wrong the, that's the wrong use but the but the people who are using it the way it should be used to help augment what they do and give themselves you know time advantage and a, and a, and, a, and and an ability to kind of search through things with the way the way with, with, you know in a manner that maybe they could have couldn't before then that's that's probably the way it should be used and it's like well is there really going to be that that big a difference between like you know what what they can find um you know online versus like what law firms can can come up with on their own i, I don't know yeah, I mean, I've written on this before where I, I think, I mean, it's the small and mid-sized firms that stand to benefit the most from this, more than the big ones, if they actually, you know, if they have, they take the leap and they invest in it and they get pulled together because, you know, like like you said, they don't have the bureaucracy. It's like not like the change management aspect. It's not turning the cruise ship of the mega firm. It's like they have to, they can be nimble and agile. And then also like, if you are, you know, people are over here freaking out about it, replacing lawyers, which I don't think it is, but, you know, if you if you don't longer need 15 associates to handle a case, that's great because these small firms didn't have the 15 associates to put on the case in the first place. They can now compete if you know if the technology is there to do it. I actually do think, I mean, like yeah. I do think there is gonna be a have and have not because there's not the resources to go around, but I think if approached correctly, it's the small people that have the most potential to benefit. Well, you know, you have to remember too that you know, having having been in a large law firm it's it's always easy to say you have something and are doing something than to actually have it and are doing it and so you know i think there could be a lot of these large firms that we are thinking are are really employing these tools across the across their entire uh firm may not actually be doing as much as it would appear that they'd be doing and and you know most law firms too it's very hard to make a partner do something if he or she doesn't want to do it uh, they don't want to use these tools and they you know okay don't use them so it's it's again in my mind it's a little hard to say as a general matter large law firms are really adopting generative ai and really going all in just on the face evidence that they say they are because it may not be really the truth and there's you know unless you're in one at the present moment, it's kind of hard to know. And even if you are, you know, if you've got five, five, a thousand partners, who knows what they're really doing? <laughs> yeah, no, I think for the most part, a lot of larger firms that are even talking about it are just rolling it out on a, on a limited, uh, limited yeah. in a particular they don't want to be or, or something like that. To, to, uh, they don't want to be the ones that aren't, right? Yeah. Um, well, where should we go from here? If uh, if your AI breaks, Oregon has a uh, a remedy for you. I think, uh, Victor, is that? Is that Hold on, works? before we wait, wait, no, wait, no, wait, no, wait, no, no, okay, okay. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Before okay. we go to that, uh, I have to intervene. It is Oregon, and that is how you say it. It is not Oregon. As a did graduate, Oregon? did I say you did? As a graduate of the University of Oregon, uh, that is not how you say. It. All right, go. Not the first time I've been chastised for that, so I. Uh, I well, that's like the whole like Nevada versus Nevada thing, right? It's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just like um, you know, yeah, I was, I, I just thought this was interesting. So, crap, or or Oregon, or or <laughs> now now I'm, confu now I'm confused. Now everyone's in their own Oregon. Head now. Yeah. Oh. Oregon. <laughs> All right, that state that's south, directly south of Washington. <laughs> um, they became the fourth state with a right of repair law for technology that um, the law went into effect on Thursday. Um, and basically, just it's supposed to make re repairing electronic devices like smartphones and laptops and whatnot easier, cheaper. Um, you know, from what from what's been written about this, it was a pretty straightforward straightforward bill that a lot of people liked and supported, except for one company. Uh, Apple did not like it, um, surprisingly enough, um, because one thing I've noticed with 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 my Apple products is that um, whenever I, whenever they start reaching the end cycle, I try to look at options to try to, to try to prolong that life cycle a little bit, like you know upgrading my batteries, or upgrading my hard drive or whatnot. And I found that my I've been able to do that with my last couple of laptops, but this one I have now, uh, I think they deliberately made it more difficult to detach uh, hard drives from the motherboard. So now you have to like, you have to like, you know, solder it off, which I don't know how to do that. Um, and I'd probably burn the whole thing. Um, so, so, you know, um, so, I mean, look, I don't, I don't know if 
that this is really going to make a difference with the way Apple does does business. Um, but you know, but it'll, it'll you know it'll be interesting to see if this catches on with other states and whether or not um, you know consumer advocates will start take will start um, you know banging the drum for more affordable more like, like laws that that protect consumers and make it easier for them to, to repair their devices because it seems like at least you know for for apple like they are making it more difficult for for consumers to to to, to upgrade the devices or fix their devices without having to buy new ones which i guess kind of cuts in the profit margin a little bit so yeah i mean i thought it was, it was it was a fun little story that 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 i saw i mean i didn't i didn't, I didn't have anything this week otherwise so it wasn't so what does it, what apple... does it actually mean i mean like how how old you know like for how long do they have to keep your 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 product alive how, how old can it get before they can say you know sorry that's we, we can't help you with that is there are there are there limits to it like that or i i assume so i mean i didn't i didn't uh i didn't look at the actual uh text of the of, of the of the of the bill but i mean you know i mean obviously like you know if if you if you have a if you have a product that that has like parts that they just can't replace or they have you know just proprietary like just unique unique like little gizmos that they can't they can't fix i'm sure that's not, not there's nothing they can do about that um but like you know i if this if this but you know if this stops companies from like making it more difficult for consumers to do like the easy upgrades like putting a new battery in or something i mean because that seems like a pretty that seems like a pretty you know basic thing that most people should be able to do but i don't even know how to do that anymore didn't didn't Apple a few years ago come out and say, yeah, we're going to let you repair your own stuff, but so in order to do it, you have to you have to order this special machine from us that's I don't know weighs fifty or a hundred pounds, and you have to get it shipped to you, and you can only use it for three days, and you have to follow these Byzantine instructions that make absolutely no sense, and everybody that tried it said this is worthless, and so they I think it finally died a natural death, but. So it's not surprising that Apple would not be in favor of this. <laughs> I, I know for a while they did a thing where like you had to you had to have a certain model of phone in that order it, to get yeah. a battery replacement, but then they had to do it and you had to pay for it and you had to like do all this stuff. It's like I was getting a new phone then. I mean, what what's which is what they wanted anyway. Yeah, and then, and and then recently they've even gone one step. You know, it used to be if you had the protection and it, your screen was cracked. Um, from being dropped, they would fix it. And I saw the other day. Now they're saying, "Well, no, we're not going to fix it. You have to pay for it. You have to pay for it to get fixed." The, be the best line in the article might be the last one, which says that other states have approved repair right to repair laws on technology. Massachusetts has one on vehicles, and Colorado has adopted one for farmers. How do you repair a farmer? Well, no, well uh, that's that was out of the John Deere. <laughs> debacle yeah because oh, of yeah, the that's, that, those yeah. combines and tractors they started a, a, you, despite the fact that i just went on a big tirade about oregon i my family's originally from iowa so i have a lot of farming roots uh is it iowa they, or iowa yeah a, it, it, that went that was really hard to mess up like it's just uh anyway uh no that john deere has turned those big uh, combines and stuff are basically self-driving at this point. The operator basically just sits in an air-conditioned cab and it's it's satellite guided to go around the space that it's supposed to, whatever. But all of that technology means that when it breaks, John Deere was trying to say, it's a black box and you have to pay us to fix it. And so, yeah, a lot of these rural states are at a forefront in the right to repair yeah because people's livelihoods are based on buying these giant pieces of equipment that they need to repair. And it, and it wasn't just the, the, the computer part of it. That was, um, that was an issue. It was, it was for years, the farmers have been fixing their John Deere tractors, right? You know, it breaks down, but I think John Deere was saying that ah, can't do that anymore. Sorry. You can't fix it yourself. And I think that, that was really the thing just, and I think there's been some litigation filed over that. I'm not oh, sure yeah. how it turned out. They, they are making, making bespoke parts that make it more difficult for you to do it on your own. Yeah, like it was it was a thing. And like it's – Deer is obviously not a – is a big player, but not a full-on monopoly, thankfully. There are, are other players, so you can choose to go elsewhere. But, I mean, it's a major capital investment. 
So yeah, yeah. it you're kind of stuck as a customer. Anyway, was that that's like the what was the printer company that that made their printers basically stop printing, stop working, not after it it quit, not after it malfunctioned, but after so many numbers of thousands of copies and it, it, printing it, they just said it just stops, even though it could still work. I don't know if that was HP or who, but somebody somebody did that. I can't remember. HP did All the right. thing where they started rejecting any uh, cartridges, print cartridges that were not HP. And then even yeah. ones that were, it started rejecting, claiming they weren't HP and it was a whole debacle. Yeah. That's when we used to print things. Those were the days. <laughs> We'll, we'll show the bastards. We just won't print anything anymore. <laughs> That's what it's got to do. It's so horrible to try to print something that when I do have to print something, I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> I can't believe I have to print that stupid thing. The stupid the stupid things never worked right anyway. <laughs> That's when you go to the office. Right. That's when you go to the office to print, but it's like no one, no one goes to the office anymore. So. <laughs> right. I don't know why. Every time in the past when I wanted to print something, that would be the exact time that it would run out of ink. I was just uncanny. <laughs> mm. All right. Now for our uh, ethics report of the week. Mickey? Yeah. Um, I wrote an article on a New York ethics opinion. It is not exactly mind blowing and it's kind of surprising that, I mean, the whole reason I wrote about it because I like to cover ethics in New York. Um, and because it's about accepting credit cards, so clearly there's a tie into you know law pay, but um, so it's relevant in to the space because I think credit cards are important. But um, wh what was interesting to me was the fact that it was even written. I mean, New York had already issued an opinion saying that you can use uh, credit cards for retainers and you can pass the fees on to um, uh, clients along with a convenience fee and they seem to feel the need to write an entirely new opinion that said the exact same thing, except that it applied to post retainer payments. I mean, it just seems to me like there are so many other ethics issues out there. It's, it's one of those ones where clearly like what they'd said before, either they could have expanded it ever so slightly. So it just applied to all credit card payments, not just retainer payments or else they just didn't even have to write this opinion. So sometimes I wonder, like there's so many other ethics issues that are important that lawyers are grappling with. So I wondered why they had to issue that. That being said, New York always does a great job. They're always sort of on the forefront and cutting edge and they deal with a lot of stuff before anyone else does. So I don't mean to bash my state, but it just kind of surprised me that this opinion was even a thing. So maybe some maybe somebody on the board thought, you know, we we ought to try out this chat GPT. Let's see if it can write an ethics opinion on this <laughs> this issue that doesn't really matter because it's already kind of just <laughs> oh gosh, look what it did. It's so cool. <laughs> Right. As as a resident of the as a resident of the state of New York, I definitely think that a state that puts Andrew Cuomo, Kathy Hochul, and Eric Adams in power must clearly always be doing a good job and the most logical thing at all times. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, I, see, I, I never I never thought I would hear New Yorkers complain as much about Eric Adams, considering the guy that came before him that you know um, that you guys love so right. much. Um, Oh, you know what's weird is De Blasio got a lot of uh got a lot of flack from particular corners, and that seeped over into other things. But basically, about a month into Eric Adams, every the memes started going around with "Miss me yet?" And yes, we absolutely do. Like clearly, uh, you had he was he was a disaster organizationally, and a lot of the like government people I know like were said that like it wasn't quite organized right but at least there was a plan and it wasn't just petty sniping and criminality all the time well it's to be expected from a state that had rudy giuliani as his <laughs> there's nothing wrong with criminality i keep mayor and was he ever governor and prosecutors in business so, I, mean, okay. so I, 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 I lived in New York for part of Giuliani's time. And I will say that we didn't know he was going to turn out this way. Right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, that I mean, being Rudy, said, <laughs> you know, Rudy, Rudy is clearly the victim of some brain rot, right? Like, this is not <laughs> the same Rudy. And Rudy sucked then, but he didn't suck in this way, if that makes any sense. Uh, but Rudy was a goddamn disaster. Uh, de Blasio was kind of a disorganized mess. He was kind of the opposite of 
Bloomberg, who was a very organized mess. Uh, and so, like, do you prefer organization or good values? That was the uh, – but now we got neither. Anyway, Seems and then like Hochul. The uh, common denominator show is mess. <laughs> I just always remember wondering what Giuliani did with all the homeless people because one day they were there and then just suddenly gone. Like, it, I shipped them off. I don't know what he did with them all. Yeah, I view that as more all, of a Bloomberg <laughs> move. I view that as a Bloomberg move. Uh, like, Giuliani, like, tried to arrest Maybe people or whatever, but Bloomberg was the one who, like, shipped everybody to, like, a different place to make the Republican convention look nicer. Uh, that was a that was a Bloomberg joint. Was it, and he was probably it? had, like, a panel of weird uh, insurance adjusters who were, like, his technocratic whatever to figure out the most logical way to put homeless people in underneath the ocean or whatever he did. What was it Koch who started trying to clean up Times Square or was that? Or no, it was, it was more Giuliani, but it was also it was also just like that was the time. Like every every place in America started getting safer in like 1990. Freakonomics has a very good uh, explanation of why that is. Uh, but Giuliani got to benefit from it. Dinkins yeah. actually is probably the person who deserves the most credit for it, but nobody ever remembers him because he lost. The Giuliani. Man, well, enough about New York. Else. Like, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll the entire time. One, there's never <laughs> enough about New York. Go. I will have to say, in the 1970s, back in the, and all, that was a scary place. The, back in the seventies, it was a very weird place. <laughs> no dis. There was no dis. We have free Wi-Fi in now. <laughs> I know we have free Wi-Fi in JFK. CWA have you been to LaGuardia recently? Have you been to LaGuardia recently? It's like it's nice now. Like I, the, yeah. Yeah, the whole amazing. time I lived in New York, LaGuardia was a dump. And now it's like yeah. it's like beautiful. I'm like, what is going it's on? It's annoying. It's yeah. annoying because yeah, the yeah. fact yeah. that it was a dump meant that it was cheaper to fly out. <laughs> and now yeah. it's not. It went but they do up. still have the Delta terminal still has those signs of like your gate, you're 20 minutes away from your gate or whatever. It's like crazy distances. Is that right? Or have they closed that up? No, it, it, yeah, the new, the new Delta is huge yeah. distances. It went, so, oh. have, it went from having literal buckets collecting water and like plastic tape to rats. the ceiling to now I having rats in there to now having like fountains with laser art were like blasted onto them. It's crazy. And it was like overnight. One day I showed up and I'm like, am I in the right city? Is this before? I was so confused. It, it, only it, only you guys from only you guys from New York could 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 talk about Times Square, the cesspool of the world back in the 70s and have it all cleaned up and complain about it. And then <laughs> have a dumpy well Guardia Airport and have it all cleaned up, and now you bitch about that. <laughs> See, it was That's a dump, fair. but it was our dump. Okay, it was our dump. <laughs> and like by dump, it was like it was like a train station kind of situation where it, it felt like what mass transit's supposed to feel like, uh, and now it's not. Uh, now, honestly, JFK has not obviously the terminal that you're in. But JFK has some of the worst terminals these days. Like Newark is new, LaGuardia is new. JFK has some work to do. I do miss this is my old person ran. I do miss being able to actually order from a person that would not have been order everything through a QR code. Ridiculous, isn't it? All right. And, so, uh, so, so Joe, do we do we want to carry on what you sought to establish yes. as a tradition? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Last week, what do you want to explain? I feel like he's already started. He's been doing it the whole show. Go on. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> I've been. I, I I was ready to do this if you didn't uh, listen to the show, but you did, so it's great. Uh, so P Doom score. We go around quickly and give our current P Doom score because everybody seems excited about that. So uh, without even having to P-Doom. explain. Just, just, just a score. Oh just yeah, P Doom. The like, how much is AI? No, I mean, no, I mean, explain the score we give. Like, why are we feeling? Oh yes, give an give an explanation for why. Good idea. Good idea. Uh, all right, so let's go uh, from the from up. I'll serpentine up through my uh, current screen. So Nikki, you're first. Well, remind me, is it a one to ten? I can't remember, and I'm no, the one that introduced the hundred up to hundred. Hundred. Yeah. A hundred. Yeah. yeah, I think. 100 being the closer to doom is, or 
It's yeah, a it's, percentage. It's a probability. Yeah. It's a percentage. Okay. All right. Yeah. So okay. 100. Probability. Keeping score. Um, I'm going to go with like 85 because I feel like all signs point to like a reboot. I'm convinced we're in a simulation and all signs point to a reboot because just the headlines lately have been just out of control. Like it's just, everything's crazy and off the chart. So I think I'm going to go with, did I say 85? 85. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that means you're feeling right. very pessimistic or very optimistic? Very pessimistic. Yeah. Very doomy. Very, yeah. yeah, very, very doomy. doomy. Okay. Yeah. But again, there are no consequences in her world because it's a simulation. So whatever. All right. So we're going to, you know, so Victor, we're moving uh, to you on my screen. I'm going to go 70 because again, like, like kind of like what I said earlier, like, you know, it, you know, a year ago, AI was barely passing the bar exam. Now it's writing Supreme Court opinions. I feel like in like a year of time, it'll be winning Pulitzer Prizes and like Oscars and stuff. And then we'll, we'll be in trouble. I, I mean, at least, you know, I'll be in trouble. <laughs> you know, like, you know, my, my, my editors are going to be like, well, we can get, we can get Claude to, to, uh, to, uh, to edit, edit the section instead of you. So um, yeah, I'm feeling 70, 75. Okay. All right. So then on my screen, that puts us at Steve next. So I, I would go with Victor in 70 to 75. Not only will he be put out of work, but so will I. <laughs> there'll be Not only will there be nothing for you to edit, Victor, there'll be nothing for me to write. So. <laughs> All right. This brings it to my law school colleague, Stephanie. I feel like I'm not very doomy this week. I think it's because I haven't really been reading the news. So that does, that does wonders for your freedom score. I mean, I was at Legal Geek, which was fun. I'm at JFK right now. I'll be back at JFK 24 hours from now to fly to London. And so, like, I don't know. I'm feeling kind of not so doomy right now. I'll give myself, like, a 40. Okay. Ooh, all right. Yeah. 40. Uh, I uh, am next on my screen. Bob, of course, gets the last word. I am <laughs> I, I'm still low. I was zero yet last week. I, I, I'm no more than a 10 now. Like, I feel as though as much as AI is advancing, its setbacks are still big enough that we're ahead of it as far as the we're going to die part. Uh, it's doing great things, whatever, but we're we're ahead of it as far as keeping it from going out of control. So I'm still, I'm like a 10 maybe. All right, Bob, last yeah, word. Yeah, well, may maybe for sort of the same reasons, although probably a little bit higher, but I'd, I'd go like a 40, I think, but it's... Partly because I feel like, yeah, it's it still isn't it's not taken over yet, and and maybe my whole my whole trip to North Carolina made me feel like it's a whole lot farther from taking over than a lot of people who are uh, kind of in in the bubble think it is. So I'm gonna go with a forty, and uh, if uh, if we're not here next week to uh, have the show, then Nikki will have won the prize. Or of course, if you there see could a just new, be very weird looking here. panelist. Could Wait. could just be our avatars here next week. Yeah, could that'll be. work. We gotta do the avatars again. Perfect. Here we go. All right. Anyway. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> that does it for this week, and uh, thanks everybody for attending. Stephanie, safe <laughs> travels. <laughs> Have fun in London. And see you all next week. Bye. Good weekend.